Today on Rightly Dividing, we're going to be talking about unconditional eternal security and predestination. What does the Bible say? That is the truth. Thank you for joining us. Learning to navigate truth in a world of opinions. Teacher Jacob Leger and your host, Pastor Daniel Wright. Heart of Worship Church Media presents Rightly Dividing. Well, we welcome you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, to Rightly Dividing Podcast. Today on episode eight, we're going to be talking about unconditional eternal security and predestination. Very interesting topic. There's a lot of beliefs on either side of the issue. So as always, please agree to disagree where applicable. But firstly, as always, seek the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to give you the truth of the Word of God. Uh, Today is a very special treat. I would like to introduce, of course, you know, Jacob Leger. Hey, guys. Hey, and also Senior Pastor. Glad to be here. Amen. We're excited to have Senior Pastor Glenn Mayu. We are actually out of our element, as you probably are aware of, based on the footage, that we are in the church and not in studio. So now we are have an actual studio live audience. So praise God for that. We got our church here on Wednesday night uh, and going to go the this route. So a little bit different format, but we're going to go with it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So good to have senior pastor Glenn Mayu. Yes. Uh, if you can, for the record on uh, the podcast with the YouTube following, I know a lot of the followers on YouTube already know who you are, but you are the founder son. I am the founder son of, at that time was Methodist Protestant church. And when my father passed away in 2000, I took over and was ordained through the Methodist Protestants but I felt a different call and my call was more into the full gospel holiness and working in the gifts and fivefold ministry. So we kind of slowly but surely eased the church that way. Amen. Amen. That is exciting. And uh, I'm also the son-in-law. So is Jacob. Yes. (laughs) So brothers and sisters, we, the son-in-laws are doing a podcast with the father-in-law. So we definitely want to make them proud. So right. How about that? Uh, so here we go. Um, I would like to very quickly, as I always do with every episode, to please watch. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on podcast, please, if you have not already watched our introductory series, that's episodes one, two, and three, because that lays the foundation for hermeneutics, how we interpret the word of God, what is the importance of those rules. And as the scripture gives us to, to rightly divide the word of truth, right. which of course is the, the goal. So we're going to kick right on in parts one and two. Uh, first, we're going to talk about predestination. And the next half of it, we're going to be talking about unconditional eternal security. So, Jacob, kick us off for predestination. Yes, predestination. Some of you may have heard this term before. It actually comes from the Latin word predestinera, meaning foreordained. This is the doctrine that all events have been willed by God, usually with reference to to the eventual fate of the individual soul. So in predestination, free will is not at play. Because of God's sovereignty, we were born to be predestined to either heaven or hell, regardless of action or outcomes. A strong tenet of Calvinism. Some of you may have heard of that term, and we'll get into the definition of uh, Calvinism here. Calvinism, no free will. So the basic beliefs of Calvinism are, are this. The five principles of Calvinism as formulated by the Synod of Dort in 1618 and 1619, are summarized in a tulip. And this is a, they use it as an acronym to help them remember their, uh, their five principles. It, it stands for de- uh, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistibility of grace, and the final perseverance of the saints. However, in contrast, Uh, On the opposite side of this is Arminianism, and that is free will. So the basic beliefs of Arminianism is it's a theological movement uh, in Protestant Christianity that arose as a liberal reaction to the Calvinist doctrine of predestination. Arminianism is the theological ideas of the Dutch Reformed theologian Jacobus Arminius and his historical supporters known as Remonstrants. The movement began in the early 1700s and asserted 
that God's sovereignty and human free will are compatible. So it's either this, we're driving our own car or we're simply along for the ride in autopilot. So we can look at the the two belief systems and agree that they're pretty polar opposite. Yeah. One you're not choosing, one you are choosing. That's correct. So to say in love, but in honesty, we can't both be right. That's Am I right? Very good point. <laughs> right, Pastor? E- either one is wrong and the other's right or vice versa, but they both cannot exist as two doctrines in one well, it, belief system. It doesn't line up with scripture. Yes. Right. You know, that's why we always say, what does the Bible say? Exactly. You want to take the now we we believe that God does predestine us right. to serve him for whatever reason, for whatever ministry. Like I was predestined to be a minister. You was predestined to be a and we've predestined to be ministers at that's where Methodist part or that's where full gospel order worship. Amen. You know, that that was from the foundations of the world. God knew God knew I was gonna rebel as a youngster. He right. knew you was going to rebel as a youngster. That's right. But he knew as we matured and we grew up in maturity, we would eventually surrender. Exactly. And, and that's the predestined I believe in. Right. Uh, I always say it this way, though we all agree that God is an omnip- uh, omniscient, is the word. I almost said omnipotent, which he is. He's omnipotent, meaning all powerful. But I'm saying omniscient, which means all knowing. God's omniscience does not negate the choice that we have. That's right. So watch this. Boom. I just lifted my left hand and I guarantee you if God were to be asked, which, what was about to happen? Oh, he's about to lift, lift his left hand. I still chose it, but he knew it before it happened. That's right. And I always use that in our church. Of course, a great example of that is parents. And it is such a small scale on a much bigger grand scheme of who God is because God is all powerful and omnipotent. But even at the level of a parent who knows their kids, great example, Jacob has Hezekiah and Shot. You know them like the back of their hand. You can sit back, watch them in an environment. They don't know you're watching, but you know that Hezekiah is about to climb the bookshelf. He's staring at it. He's looking up at it. He looks around. Where's mom and daddy? Oh, here he goes. It's a given. He had the choice, but daddy knew. That's right. And that's really what it comes down to. And and to, to be honest, as Armenians that we are, the word predestined is in Scripture. No one denies that. Yes. So the question is not, is predestination biblical? Yes, it is. But the question is, what is predestination? Right. And we're going to cover that, actually. If we can, I'm going to read through a few verses that are on the Calvinistic side that are used to encourage or support the belief system that we don't have free will choice, but that because God knows what we're doing, that is an, uh, that is not an option that we have, whether for salvation or damnation. Let's go there. So the, the, the scriptures they use is Romans eight twenty nine through 30. That's one of them. We're going to cover a few for those whom he foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And to those whom he called, he also justified. And those those whom he justified, he also glorified. So that sounds pretty pointed that, yeah, he, he knows. Yeah, it says he whom he predestined. Exactly. And he predestined, he called, he called, he justified, and justified, glorified. So that's the process of those that were, you know, of course, in predestined. So we're having this mindset, okay, I could see where they're coming from. But now Ephesians one, four through five. And then verse 11, it says, according to, excuse me, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to this good pleasure and will. Now verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being here again, predestined that word according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Uh, really quick, John six forty four. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And again, John fifteen sixteen. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain. And that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So now what we need to look at and divide is that 
for the historical context at the time, number one, for the last one I just gave, we're going to talk about the other ones real quick, but the very last one, John 15, 16, he says, you have not chosen me, I've chosen you. What a lot of people don't realize is that if we divide in the scriptures the difference between what is theology and historical context, though many times those two intersect, in this case, it is very much a historical because at the time, rabbis did not choose their disciples. Jesus chose his disciples, which was against the religious establishment of that time. Jesus' disciples may have even sat under other rabbis before, and they didn't make the cut. So they went back to work in a family business in many cases, and of course of the 12, many were fishermen, probably went back to the lake to fish, and that was right before Jesus had found them. Example, Peter, Andrew, James, and they were all fishing. So in John 15, 16, we're looking at a, a cultural historical context of Scripture that exposes the fact that where it was normal that the disciples were choosing the rabbi, Jesus changed, flipped the script, right. that Jesus said, come and follow me. That's why you see in the scripture, almost emotionally, you can see they're shocked. They're like, who, me? Yeah, like, they just go and they just, like, they, they left sure. their stuff and followed him. Yeah. They were excited because it's like, I don't have to work this grade to, to, to get the passing grade and then earn it. He came to me. Right. And you can With, see it from the, uh, the point of view is, like I said, if they did follow another rabbi and didn't make the cut, they could have been, you know, it could have been a depressing moment in their life. But when the rabbi comes and calls you, right, that's kind of a restored faith in that, you know, in that. So that that's why I think they were excited. They left and they just went, you know. Exactly. Uh, let's look at a scripture, Titus. Titus two eleven says, "For uh, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation had appeared to all." Men, all and, men, and that's the key word is all. All men. I love it. There's, there's no exception. Mm-hmm. It's not an exception because of race. It's not an exception, and we know this means women too. Right, it's right. It doesn't have mankind. Any, mankind, right. So, because of grace, all men were called exactly salvation. That's right. And, and really quick too, the bottom line predestination, of course, is biblical. And we talked about this, but here's my nail in the coffin. I did mention my rebuttal for John 15, 16 to help rightly divide that verse as historical. But what about Romans 8 or what about Ephesians 1? What about John 6? Now, here's the deal. I wrote this down. I'm going to read it word for word so I don't miss it. The interpretive problem, however, lies in the intended audience. I'm going to say that one more time. The interpretive problem of predestination lies specifically in the intended audience of who is predestined. Calvinism applies predestination to the individual while Armenianism applies predestined to the collective, all humanity. And and let me say this. Right. Because you're right there. I believe both ways. God calls nations and he calls individuals. Correct. I think God ordained America to be a nation of Christianity. Amen. I mean, I know we don't show that way nowadays. (laughs) It's hard to see it that way, right? You know, when when your uh, pyramids uh, came on the first boats, they were true men of God. Right. And naturally, then sinful people came in and started doing sinful things like slavery and other stuff. Sure. But your true uh, forefathers of America that came here was true people that was pure and all about God. They came here to right. be able to serve God freely. Right, right. In England and other places, they, they were pushing the Catholic Church on them. They were right. persecuting them. Persecuting them, right. right. So as a collective, you can see America as the shining city on a hill yes. right. that God had called under Judeo-Christian values right. that have been over time perverted, as you see with pretty much every nation yeah. uh, in that thing. But, uh, of course, when, when the Bible is, uh, of course, just the simple one, let's go John three sixteen. There's not a single person that has been in church for more than a year that could not quote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever. That's right. Right, Pastor? That's That's the word you like, that whosoever. Whosoever. I had it in my notes. (laughs) Sure. I mean, (laughs) and it's crazy because we we could be here all night talking about everything, but to be honest, for the sake of time, we don't have an exhaustive list list of all scriptures that really hone in the words whosoever, the words all that is for anyone who would come. It is specifically in scripture, 
all across scripture that when Christ died, he did not die for a collection of a small group of people. He died for the sins of the entire world. That's right. He made the, the, the pavement wide available. Unfortunately, though, we know through scripture that few are they that find salvation. Jesus prophesied that. But he paved the way for opportunity for many. That's right. And can all. I, can I say. give you another scripture? Yes. Joshua 24, 15 says, choose this day whom you will serve. What does that word choose mean? Mm, that's good. That's, that's, that's a free will word. That's right. So that's, that's telling you that you got free will there. Mm-hmm. So that, as we just covered, were the scriptures that will lay the foundation for the Calvinistic viewpoint of predestination. But again, no one's denying predestination if they're honest. It's biblical, but the question is interpretation. It's not based on the individual, though that God calls us as individuals, yes. but the point of redemption, specifically salvation, because that's the that's the that's where the rubber meets the road when Calvinism talks about predestined is about damnation versus salvation, is they're looking at it as individuals. We as Armenians see the uh, the predestination through the blood of Jesus on, on Calvary's cross was redemptive for the whole world. Yes. As an opportunity. Yeah. We're not universalist, which in universalism, some of y'all may not know, but there's a doctrine of universalism that believes because Christ died, everyone's going to heaven. Well, that's not scriptural either. So we don't want to pen, turn the pendulum right. that far. Right. right. But uh, for the Armenian viewpoint. Yeah, the Armenian viewpoint, we got quite a few scriptures here. We'll just jump into some of them. Second uh, Peter 3, 9 states, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men can count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we underline the any and all. Yes, they are. <laughs> not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to, to, to repentance. Right. So we say, well, Lord, what is your will? It's his will for everyone to go to heaven. Again, he died for the sins of the whole world. Right. Uh, let me say this. Mm-hmm. Anybody here, you, know, you can answer this in your own heart. Did you feel God, God call you as individuals? It, yes, God has called us all as individuals. Right. But at the same time, he called Israel as a nation. That's right. Amen. So, you know, so I agree with the uh, Calvinists on, on the part that he does call all, you know, all people but I also believe on the other side where he does call individuals. That's right. That's right. To do, I mean, he called called Moses to do his task. Right. He called Abraham to do his task. So everybody's got a task to do for God. That's he's good. going to call you to it. So I like that. Actually, it just kind of popped in my head, pastors, when you said that, because like you said, predestination does apply to the individual truly under Armenianism. But if you look at it, when it comes to redemption, it's for the collective. Yeah. But he calls Moses to say, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. That's right. He didn't call Aaron to do it. He called Moses. So as an individual, there are individual callings that we've been predestined to. That's right. But right. that's the calling, not the redemption. That's right. That's right. There's a difference. So Acts 2.21 states this, <laughs> that it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That encompasses everybody. Whosoever. Right. That's not just, and that's the redemptive side there. Revelation twenty two seventeen, And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. There's that whosoever. free will. You have to freely take it. It's not, you weren't, it's not a, no, no free will that you take the water. It's not just forced on you. You have to freely take it. A whosoever search in your in your apps can draw many, many more results than what we just gave here. Which, to like, be honest, we did that, and it was like, no, we'll be there two hours. Let's yeah. just go ahead and just pick a few. Right, right. We're just so we're, we're going to spitfire the ones that we have here as, as we started, and we're con- going to continue. Exactly. So I'm, what I'm saying is this. If, when you look at Scripture, I, don't, I, don't, I can't comprehend how people would come to this belief that you don't have a free will. Mm-hmm. Because God gave you a free will to go to McDonald's and Burger King. He gave you a free will to drive a Chevrolet or a Ford. But he didn't give you a free will for your own salvation. Yeah. That don't make sense to me. That's good. No, that's true. That's true. 
Yeah, I mean, again, it's very difficult for people like us to grasp, but we, we try our best to try to at least see where they're coming from so that we can say, okay, so I get that part of it, but you're forgetting these other parts. When you have just a few verses that talk about the word predestination, but at the same time, you've got 87 other scriptures that'll say whosoever, all, all of those key words that encompass the collective of humanity, not just the individual, then you have to really kind of, how do you justify? How do you conflate that? Because in our introductory series, Jacob and I were talking about when it comes to the interpretation of scripture, you have to, one of the tenets of interpretation is believing that the Bible is inherently the word of God. As it regards the proper interpretation of scripture, you have to at least say, okay, I believe the entire Bible start to finish. If you can, if anyone that is listening on podcasts or watching on YouTube that would say to me, Uh, some of it's right, some of it's not, then we have nothing to talk about. Because anything that I'll bring to you and say, well, thus they ask the Lord, then you'll be like, well, that's that was, I didn't trust the author. I didn't trust David. He messed up too much. Paul, I get, but see, you if you have that mentality, then anything could be false doctrine in scripture. It's either all wrong or it's all right. That's it. So we got a question. Did Christ die for my sins or for your sins? The answer is he died for all. That's going back to the Armenian. Now let's just try this since we do have a, a studio audience. If I say all, wow. there you go. Y'all heard that? Everybody. We got a couple of more scriptures here. And let me say this. Yeah, under the Calvinist belief, if a, if a child dies, and I've done did funerals for children that was hit by vehicles and right. one thing or another, all these children, if they were born to go to hell, went to hell. According to the according to Calvinism, the Calvinism, the Calvinism. Teachings. right, right. And, and I just don't believe that. Because, uh, you'll never make me believe that God created a child for him to live five years, six years, seven years, whatever age, and got hit by a vehicle, and that was the purpose in that child. To me, that's mm-hmm. crazy. Uh, I just don't believe it. I can't buy that. Uh, I think I agree. I think this child, whoever it is, whatever age they are, because you could be twenty years old and still be not accountable for your sins because you have mental problems or whatever. Right. So whatever the age would be that a person see, like a person, let me say like this, like a person like me and Pastor Danny, we were accountable as small children because our parents, church goers. And we were the only to the altar since we were babies. Right. So we, we've been knowing right from wrong since we're babies. So accountability is, was on us at a young age where you got some people who never went to church in their lives and they, they 15 years old, they, they still don't know right from wrong. Right. But you know, that's one of the reasons I have a problem believing this because the fact that, they believe that babies even go to hell. Right. And again, I want to stress this, this fact. It's so, it's so blatantly obvious to me. It was like just the, the light bulbs were going off over my head. The moment I had the revelation, I know it was the Holy Spirit, is the conflation of his omniscience. If God is all-knowing, and it says also in Scripture that he knew you before you were formed in the womb, he knew So the truth is, yes, there are babies being born that God knows that they're going to end up in hell one day. That's the, that's where that, that, that's the conflate uh, where it could conflicts. Yeah. They can't conflate his omniscience with free will. And it's to us, it's pretty obvious. It's like he's giving you legal option to choose to, 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 to us. It would not be fair if we stand before God. And he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I'd be like, you didn't give me an option. I was your robot. You programmed me for this. That's right. How can a just God, who is just, he's Jehovah, how could he send you to hell if he's predestinedly programmed you genetically for hell? That's right. Yep. That's not a just God. Then at that moment, you realize in that, whoa, then God's not just. See? Yeah. Let me say this. Go ahead. I talked to an individual, and I'm still dealing with this individual as we speak. And I told him, I said, for me to believe what you're saying, I'd have to believe that the devil and God is playing chess with our lives. Like just one big chess game. 
Mm. It, to me, that's like you're saying, it's not a just God. It's mm-hmm. not a fair right. God. That's right. And the game's rigged. God already rigged it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you see, and that's why the foundational episodes, episodes one, two, and three, of our introductional series is crucial because we cover those things. We talked about the character of God, not just the uh, the authenticity of the entirety of Scripture, but if the character of God is in direct contradiction with your interpretation, we discussed that, then your interpretation is flawed. Yep. If God is truly just, loving, merciful, and a good judge, everything that you interpret has to conflate with his character. That's right. So as you mentioned just a minute ago, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So here's another question. Do we have free will or no? The answer, it would be very difficult to tell Israel to bring a free will offering in the Old Testament if all things were placed in order divinely and man does not have free will. Yep. So God is all knowing. And so, yeah, that points to free will. So definitely. some people may not be familiar, Jacob, as right. much as you are when it comes to the Levitical laws, as well as the, uh, the, uh, the sacrifices, the offerings and right. things like that. So if you can do a quick elaboration. So there's, that, yeah, a quick elaboration. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So make it quick, right? No, I'll try. Um, so you had, you had multiple offerings. You had the burn offerings. You had the free will offerings. You had the wave offerings and all this, but free will specifically was you, it was of your own. It wasn't the ones that God said that you had to do is it was free will. You brought it. It was a Thanksgiving. It was to make peace with God. And, uh, so that's that's what it was. It was, just, it was simply a free will offer. So let's talk about the guy. His his name, uh, give me an Israelite name. Uh, Benjamin. Benjamin. Okay, so there's this guy named Benjamin who wakes up one morning and decides he's going to bring a dove as a free will offering pastor. We use an example. Right. God knew that he was going to wake up the next morning and God knew that he was going to bring a dove. But did Benjamin have the choice to not do it? Sure. Yes. He woke up that morning with a conscious decision internally to say, you know what? Today's the day for a free will offering. I have a dove. I'm going to give it to God. Right. God knew it, but that did not take away his choice. In the same way that in we walk in this life, when he says life and death, blessings and cursings, when it comes to the opportunity for salvation that Christ died on the cross for all, we have the choice and the free will option to say, I'm going to choose that. But whether you lift your left hand as it did earlier or the right hand, God knows what you're going to do. That's right. But you still have the choice. Yeah. So we had another question. Are we going to give an account of our life at judgment? Yes. Matthew 12, 36 states this. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account for thereof in the day of judgment. That said... How can we give an account for actions we were programmed by God to do or not do? Crucially, what would be the point of judgment altogether? That's kind of what you pointed out a little bit earlier. Yeah, I kind of get ahead of ourselves because we know what the notes are, right? right? So it's like, oh, that was a good point. I'm going to throw it in now. But yeah, if you stand before God and he programmed us to go straight to hell or straight to heaven, then what would be the whole point of, okay, let's stop and do these semantics? Right. No, there's a reason for judgment because God's saying you knew better but you didn't do it or you knew better and you heeded the word. Well done, that good and faithful servant. Exactly. So now we're on to part two here, the uh, unconditional eternal security, or as, as it's more commonly known, once saved, always saved. Yep. Can, abbreviated, abbreviated yeah. it. U E S. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. <laughs> so can we lose our salvation? And I, I say lose, I can't say an underline, but, Keep that, keep that lose your salvation in mind because we're going to point that out here in a minute. So for the unconditional eternal security viewpoint, here's some scriptures used to uh, support it. John 10, 28 states, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's true, that no man can pluck you out of God's hand. Right. But you, that doesn't stop you from leaving yourself for, from removing yourself from God's hand. And that's, that's, that's where free will comes in again. Exactly. Got it. 
Because it doesn't say that you, you're not going to be removed from God's hand. It just says no man can pluck you out. That's right. Nobody else can determine that for you. It's it's your choice. So, Jacob, you cannot pluck me out of God's hand. Can't Pastor Glenn cannot pluck me out of God's hand. That's, That's right. what it's saying. An external force That's right. is not able to pluck you out of the hand of God. Hebrews 6, 4 through 5 states, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Yes, if you take that those first those only those two verses, sure, you're eternally secure. It says it's impossible for them to who were once enlightened to uh, to turn away from it. Right. But we're going to go into some uh, some points here. So in the context of the opening verse, just before it, verses one through three state this: Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptism and of laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. The point is he was making was on spiritual maturity. Right. So that part where it says it is impossible for those who were once enlightened is not saying it is impossible to lose your salvation. It's saying that if you're saved, it's impossible not to desire the growth. You know, if I'm in first grade, my goal is to get to second grade. When I'm in second grade, my goal is to get to third grade. And the Lord knows that if you're a teenager and you're in 11th grade, you're like, I'm ready to get out of this high school. And then you find out actually adulthood is worse, right? (laughs) Stay in school. Spiritual maturity was the context of the passage when he's saying it's impossible. It's like, why would you want to just... Go backwards, like that's right. the it. It's like and let me put my half a cent in. Oh, go ahead. That's the what... inflation it ain't two two cent <laughs> words, half a cent. Half a cent ain't worth nothing, Pastor. Uh, and I think this is where they get confused. Once a person experiences Christ and the love of God, right? They're never going to be normal, right? But that doesn't mean that they're going to remain in God's good grace if they backslide or they start living in sin again. Even though they're living in sin, they know something in their heart's not right. Exactly. Con- conviction. Conviction. Right. right. And and a lot of these people are used King David as an example because he was under conviction. But like I told one of my buddies one time, I said, but at any time that he was in rebellion, if he'd lost his life, he'd have, went, he'd have died. He'd have went to hell. Yeah, willful rebellion. He, yeah, yeah. Because just because he was under conviction doesn't mean he was still in God's will. God was trying to bring him back. He was right. He was dealing with him. Right, right. But you know, at the same time, God can be dealing with you. And if you don't come back or you don't heed, heed God's calling and you die in that state, well, sorry for you. You're going to end up in, on the wrong side. That's right. The The one verse that we're going to talk about back to that Hebrews section is verse 6. Because most of this stuff, most of these, these doctrines or uh, lines of thinking, they take one verse. Right. And that's it. Just, they forget the verses before and after. So verse six really, really pulls this together. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify themselves, the son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Again, so, part of this passage. Yes, that's right. So here's the question in regards to all of this. Why renew again unto repentance if you never lost your salvation, there would be no point. Exactly. So, and and I remember, let me tell, give you honest confession, Pastor. When I came across this verse uh, where it says, "For it is an impossible once enlightened part," and I'm reading it, Hebrews, and I go, Boom. like I'm a confession here. I was like, "Oh my gosh, maybe we can't lose our salvation." Like it was like so that way, but that's where a part of the uh, that we covered in our introduction series context. And I know that sounds so uh, preschool, but many people don't do that. Read the whole chapter. This is quite literally, look, that's verse six. It said, renew again into repentance. Again, you realize, well, then if you didn't lose it, then why repent? That's right. You're going to go to heaven. There's no point, right? Verse six compared to what verse four, you're literally talking about two verses. Just keep reading. That's just like we talked, covered it about judging, right? If you read the verse that says, judge not lest you be judged, boom. <laughs> you you took the picture, right? The frame, y'all ready? And put it right on your nose. And you were like, it's a red picture. It's a red pic. No. Oh, there's green, there's purple, there's brown. Right. There's, see? Yes. Literally the saying goes, 
It's the big picture we're looking at. So in context, he's saying you have to repent to renew again into repentance because you've fallen off the wagon. Right. In in my studies, I, I picked up on that whole doctrines or whole religions or denominations was built on a few scriptures. That's right. But they didn't read four or five scriptures before or four or five scriptures after. Right. Exactly. They, they read that one scripture, and the teaching of once saved, always saved is that way. The, uh, the wondrous doctrine is that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, people think if you don't speak in tongues, you're not going to go to heaven. It's because they're not reading the scriptures before and after. Yeah, oh, and, and even just all across the scripture, right? Mm-hmm. So to your point about context, it, it, it is contextual to say, well, the book of so-and-so in the Old Testament Versus new. So it's all over scripture. In fact, the Bible says that out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, all things shall be established. Part of the accuracy and rightly dividing the word of truth of the word of God. Part of the rule is that you have to see out of two or three scriptures. So if you were dead set on this, it's a black and white issue. This is what it is. But you don't have a second verse to back it up. You don't have a third verse to back that interpretation up. Then you've misinterpreted it. Yeah, you're God's, right. God's it, word is going to confirm itself. It's going to confirm it's itself. Going you're going to get it all over the scriptures. And you're saying two or three words. We're showing. Oh yeah, buku words. <laughs> <laughs> like Jacob said, just a simple search of whosoever. Boom. Now some won't be in context of salvation, right? But you're going to find quite a bit of them. Right. Can Can I give you all the scripture? Yeah. Matthew twenty four thirteen says, "But he that shall endure until the, the end." end. Shall be Be saved. saved. Come on, somebody. What does the word endure mean? Mm. It means the last or continue. Right. That's one scripture kills kills it all for me. Oh, yeah. You know? Right. It's telling you that you got to endure. You got to hang on. Yeah. Endurance implies it's going to be a length of time. Right. And you can quit. Because if he's exhorting you to endure, he, right. he knows there's an option to quit. That's right. That's Why would I encourage a runner on a track? To endure if there was no understanding that they could quit. That's right. Romans 8, uh, did we cover Romans 8, 38 and 39? For I'm persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things are present nor things to come nor height nor death nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And again, we're still talking about the unconditional eternal security viewpoint that no one can lose their salvation. So again, we covered out of John 10 about any man, the external forces. We just covered Hebrews 6 about renewing again into repentance and uh, Romans 8, 38. That, all those things, death, life, angels, principalities, powers, it lists all sorts of things. It's talking about the love of God. That's right. <laughs> my daddy loves me in spite of the fact that he had to tear my butt up. Yep, me too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be honest, there are there are good fathers that allow the son of the daughter to rot in prison for what we call tough love, because that's what brings us uh, as the Hebrews as the book of Hebrews chapter six says to renew again into repentance. The, the consequences of our choices will still be a matter of suffering because we chose to do it. Just because my dad loves me, it does not mean he's going to rescue me out. In fact. Very clearly, I'm reminded of some of our laity in our brothers and sisters in our faith and our flock had brought out scriptures that basically says you actually hate your children if you don't discipline them. That's right. Which is a strong word, but you can find that in scripture as well. Parents, if you truly love your kids, you're not afraid to whip that belt out. <laughs> That's it. Let me let me give you all another scripture in Acts 2, 21. It says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall, shall be saved. saved. Come on, Pastor. That's it. Whosoever. That, that doesn't, once again, that doesn't give me a, a woman or a man or a, a child or an old man or it's whosoever. That's right. Everybody. So whosoever even includes the people that are believed to be predestined for hell? Yep. Oh, here you go. It includes them. It includes them. So now let's talk about the Armenian viewpoint. That is where we stand on scripture (laughs) as far as the uh, concept of understanding that salvation can be forfeited. Unconditional eternal security is patently and provably false. Salvation is not lost so much as it is technically, I use the word forfeited. And that's what I mentioned in the the last one when I said you can lose your salvation. We say lose, but it's more of a, a forfeiting. Right. 
instead of a losing it. I, I use the example, Jake, because every husband can can attest to this: the keys. <laughs> I have lost my keys so many times. That was not a willful choice. Uh, my brain is just not connected at the moment. <laughs> I set them down in the kitchen. I walk away. Next thing you know, I have no idea, idea where it's at. Salvation is not that tantamount to sensitivity. That's why we don't, I don't like to say lose salvation. I say you basically gave it up. Right. We, we are saying as Christians that we have been born again and over time. And I think, of course, it's not an overnight process. Let's be honest. Usually when someone backslides in total willful rebellion is because of the fact that they had over time stopped praying, stopped reading the word. They didn't crucify their flesh. They decided they were too sick to come to church or it was raining. Uh, Not that church saves you, but all the spiritual feeding you can adhere to, the more you you starve your spirit, the closer you're going to get to that. Forsake not the assembly. Yes. And... You know, the assembly is us, the, you know, the church goers. Mm-hmm. And we're there to encourage each other. Right. And to lift each other. Even Christ sent everybody by at least two. Right. That's right. And it was right. for one of the disciples to be getting discouraged, well, the other one can pick him up. Mm-hmm. Probably the next day, the other one's getting discouraged, and the other one can pick him up. Exactly. Right. And that's exactly. What it, that's, what it was all, that's why he sent people by two. Right. That's right. Um, so talking about just in the simple concept of, a viewpoint. Someone might say, here's my list of reasons that I believe this doctrine, right? Or for example, abortion, is it right or wrong? Well, I already have about 12 different things I can bring out that prove that as Christians, we definitely support life and we don't believe in killing babies. That's right. Saying that of this viewpoint, I was just going to go right to the nitty gritty. My absolute favorite reason that it is absolutely patently false that you cannot lose your salvation is true that you can forfeit it. It's the Lamb's Book of Life. Let's talk about that. The Lamb's Book of Life is the list of names that within are those that are specifically listed that they are going to heaven. If you look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, it says, And there shall be in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whosoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Just a few scriptures on names being blotted out. For your sake and homework, you can look up Exodus 32, 33, Psalm 69, 28, and Revelation 3, verse 5, and then chapter 22 of the same book, Revelation, and verse 19. Those are just a few, not all of them, that specifically say that your name could be blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. So if the Lamb's Book of Life, as according to Revelation chapter 21, 27, tells you that these are they that are going to heaven, it is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, if you can be blotted out, that means you were qualified for heaven, but you have been removed. Yeah. Yep. There's a few others that we could talk about again, but I like to go ahead and lead with the, the well, hard to deny that one, right? Right, exactly. So if, if in, in, for example, in Revelation, I honestly don't remember it was chapter 3 or chapter 22, but it says, any, if any man ta- add to or take away what is in Scripture, his name will I blot out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Right. So in other words, if you try to add to Scripture, or you try to take away from scripture, which goes to our whole point of this podcast, rightly dividing the word of truth. If your if your doctrine as a quote unquote Christian adds to scripture or removes scripture like holiness, but saying we live in sin, then you are in danger yes. of being removed out of the Lamb's book of life. The parable of the seed. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. In, in, it's uh, in Luke eight, and it's telling you some seed fall on. Stony ground, some fell on good ground. Right. But if they're telling you some of them has actually took the word of God in their heart, but because of lust or whatever, the devil came in and deceived them, mm-hmm. they fell by the way. So, right. I mean, that's the parable of the seed is a good example of a person who was once serving the Lord and then quit serving the Lord. I mean, I, it, in my 50 something, 55 years in this church, Believe me, I didn't see a lot of people come to this altar to accept the Lord. Right. And their lives changed. Right. But through a hardship or whatever reason, they backslid or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And they're no longer serving the Lord. Uh, and I'm so glad you brought up that point, Pastor, because let's also address the elephant in the room. As we want to do with all of the topics, especially if it is a modern doctrine that many people fall for into that, which can be false. In this case, one of the uh, things that we hear is, quote, oh, well, they were never saved. 
if that person is back in the bar rooms and they are an alcoholic beating their wife, then they were, quote, never saved. Now, I have a huge problem with that. Oh, yes. <laughs> a huge problem. Aside from the fact that the Bible clearly tells you how to be saved, and it's not terribly complicated if you surrender your life, you repent of your sins, you do that, of those things. I can tell you, from aside from Scripture, in my own life, my, own, my life, those that were around me, that have had a radical transformation. Right. And have completely turned around. I remember there was one time that I ran from God and I got, I, I, I had people tell me, you look like a different person. They're like, I'm not just saying that you literally look new. The physical appearance had changed my lifestyle, my desires, everything it had changed. But when I ran from God, yep, it, it was night and day. Uh, I had a youth pastor when I was a kid without a doubt was radically saved. There was nothing that, that, that could tell me anything different of the fruit that he was bearing. And he eventually backslid, backslid and went, as the, the Proverbs say, back to the, as a dog returneth to the vomit. And that's what happened. But there, when people had, t- had told me about that youth pastor, oh, well, he was never really saved. And I heard that. I'm like, homie, you don't know who he was. Exactly. Yeah. You really don't. Well. Yeah. I mean, think about this. What about Judas? I mean, Judas, the Bible does not exclude him from the passage where it says he sent them out and they were healing and all those were oppressed of the devil. They were casting out demons. They come back and said, Jesus, it's so amazing that by your name, all these demons are fleeing. When the Pharisees told Jesus, you're doing it under the power of Beelzebub, and he said, a kingdom of divided against itself cannot stand. So if you have scriptural proof of all disciples that are casting out demons, Jesus himself said, you're not doing it in the power of the devil, you're doing it in the power of God. And no one who is not saved could not do that. That's right. We have quite a list of scriptures underneath the uh, the Armenian. Maybe just read the red points for for their homework. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll hit these kind of quick because yeah, that's why I say we need to give them a copy. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, and also too, let's go ahead and put this on as a link to download. If you're watching on YouTube, the, in a, the description box, box we're going to add a download link for this document. So when you click it, it'll be a PDF. It'll go right to you and you can see exactly what we're talking about. Right. All the scriptures, even the ones that uh, we had to skim over and stuff, but we have all the, all the references there. Uh, we're going to hit the, hit the highlights of this. So out of Hebrews two, three, it states, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation real quick? Jeremiah seventeen five. thus saith the Lord cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh his own flesh his arm and whose heart departeth, departeth from, the from the Lord. James five nineteen through 20 states, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. And the key phrase at the beginning is err from the truth. That's right. And it puts the nail in the coffin. Yeah. yeah. Air from the truth. That means you yeah. can turn from away from it. That's you can right. forfeit it. Yeah. If someone is to air from something, that means that they were on one side, which right. in this case is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And if you err from it, you have left it. That's the brick in the hearse. <laughs> there you go, Pastor. <laughs> Some of y'all may not know this on the podcast or on YouTube, but uh, the brick in the hearse is kind of a no joke to go back with Pastor Glenn. It's just going to be, it's a blatantly obvious. If someone threw a brick in a hearse, everyone would be like. Exactly. <laughs> Can't miss that one. Your eyes would be popping for sure. Oh yeah, eyes popping. We stated this one earlier, uh, Matthew 10, 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth till the end, the same, same shall same. be saved. Behold, therefore, uh, the goodness and severity of God. On them which fell severity, but... Toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. Ouch. I don't know. It's like the more we read, Pastor, it feels like there's more bricks in the hearse. You know well, what I mean? Uh, I was just thinking of uh, Ezekiel 3 about the, the righteous man. Yep. Doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity and dies, he shall die in his sin. And the righteousness which he hath. Has done. Has done. That's right. Has done. Shall not be remembered no more. I'm sure we have it in here. It was coming up the next verse. Oh, yeah. One of the next verses. (laughs) Hey, but you know what's crazy though, Jacob? The last episode, episode seven on judging, we actually brought that point out because the same passage of scripture, though it is, as we see, talking about backsliding backsliding Christians who willfully commit sin, then die in their sin, then they're they're going to hell. 
it also covers the reality that the watchman on the wall is to say, hey, you're sinning. Come back to the truth. Make yeah. a judgment. You have to make a judgment call, not being judgmental, but right. to tell them, guys, you are running from God and this is dangerous. We are commissioned by Christians. And I hate to bleed back to episode seven, but if you haven't seen it, watch that one too. Yep. Because it is our job as Christians to, in love, keywords, and in meekness, Galatians 6, one, to restore the, such a one to repentance. Yes. So uh, another really good one is uh, Hebrews ten twenty six. If we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Uh, continuing in that same chapter, verses 38 and 39. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back into perdition. That's the same thing as hell but of them that believe to the saving of the soul and perdition in the strongs is defined as the following, the destruction, which consists of eternal misery in hell. Uh, another black and white one. Uh, second Peter chapter two, verse 20. If I could uh, read this one for, if after they had escaped the pollutions of this world, that's salvation through the knowledge it specifically even continues to say the Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. And they are entangled again. They've gone back to the world. And overcome, it says the latter end is worse. If I say worse, worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to know the way of righteousness after that they have known it and experienced it, turned from the holy commandment, delivered unto them. And again, as it quotes the Psalms, turning back to the true pro- uh, proverb, that the dog is returned unto its vomit again. And that is so obvious. Yeah. It How is it worse at the end than the beginning if you never lost your salvation? It can't be. You can't conflate the two with that verse alone. It specifically says that if you entangled with the pollutions of the world again, it's worse for you having rebelled than it was had you never known the way of righteousness. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jake. No, uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to uh, skip Second Peter two twenty because that's another brick in the hearse. <laughs> uh, Ephesians five three through five states: But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. That's saved people. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ of God. Pretty to the point there. Oh, yeah. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That goes back to the giving up. That's right. Don't give up. And Pastor Glenn, there's your one in our notes, the very last one. This is number 20, by the way, guys. I'm letting y'all know we didn't cover all 20, but for the sake of time, we're, we're just kind of you know, skipping through a few of them. But Matthew chapter 24, 13. Go ahead and read it, Pastor. But he... That shall endure till the end shall be saved. Amen. Come on. Everybody shout amen. amen. That's amen. a good one. Yes. And you brought up that if two or three scriptures right. coincide, then we take it as the Holy Spirit telling us to pay attention. Exactly. Repetition is yeah. like, hey, we're and, trying to get your, yeah. And how many we got here? That's, we didn't cover all 20, but oh, we have no. a list of 20 right here. We have here. a list of 20. And that's not exhaustive. There's right. more than this. If you're listening on podcast and not on YouTube, uh, email us at info at heartofworshipchurch.com and we will prepare the link and send it back and say, here, here's, our, here's our document, you know. Right. And send, send it to you your way. Let's summarize. Scripture unequivocally states that God paved the way for all all to receive eternal life. Everyone, everyone on earth, not just a select few. That's it. The reality that there only will be a select few in heaven compared to those that have received damnation does not negate the fact that his blood was a redemptive sacrifice willingly given to mankind as a whole, not just the select few. And secondly, eternal security is eternally secure for the eternal believer. That's key. I forget who it was. He said that it was in the 70s. Really powerful man of God. Y'all remember who he was? What's his name? Uh, ah, moment lost. Was it Ravenhill? There you go. Leonard Ravenhill. Thank you. Leonard Ravenhill famously said that eternal security is eternally secure for the eternal believer. Keywords, eternal believer. We're saved by faith. Right. But if we lose our faith, 
you're not a believer. You or you didn't truly believe in the first place, and you. That yeah, is so, possible, yeah. you know. And to that their argument that it, that can be the case where people truly weren't saved, but that doesn't mean that those who were saved do not have an option. I, I get back to my 55 years of experience at this altar. Yes, yes. I have seen people that caught got caught up in the emotion, and they right. went through an emotional thing. That's an excellent point. We do be, need to address that because. And the reason I know it, I'm not judging, is because there wasn't a change in their lives. Right. You know, they got up from this altar that Monday morning. It was on Facebook telling dirty jokes and one thing and another. Mm-hmm. Well, I knew this individual or individuals because it has been more than one. Mm-hmm. I knew they wouldn't last in church. So I, I do believe that's at some points, at some times, People will go to the altar, they'll go through the emotions, and I don't know if they get caught up in emotions or whatever it is. Yeah, it causes true. Them, but, but they, in their hearts, wasn't for real. Right. But that's not often. You know, when you yeah. see the person, the first sign I look for is hunger. Hunger yeah. for more of God. That's right. And if that person has hunger for more of God, mm-hmm. they want to study their Bible and and ask questions, they'll call and ask questions and uh I used to have people call and ask me questions all the time. Yeah. Well, I, I could see when they were growing because by the questions they were asked. Right. You know, the, their questions was getting out. Even I had to scratch my ear. More complicated. <laughs> you know, it's more like, hold com- on. Slow down. I, Let I, me I write go, this down. I, yeah, I got to go research this myself. <laughs> right. So I knew they were growing in grace, and I knew that there was a change. That type of person, if he backslides or she backslides a year later, I still believe they accepted the Lord and they were growing in grace. Oh, yeah. And they just, for whatever reason, got discouraged for family problems or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And, and they just backslid. Yeah, it, it is true that some people don't truly get converted, as the scripture says, because they'll come for an emotional experience or feel in any way pressured and obligated. But people that have come and have changed their lives, uh, if, if you allow the devil to infiltrate with the smallest things that the old saying about the frog in the water, yeah. slow boil. And that's happened. That's happened with me. I can testify to the fact that I lost my, I forfeited my salvation when I ran from God deliberately. And, and, and I want to go really quick to the point about that. You said that if you've been saved once before, it's kind of difficult in, in that you feel achy. There were so many times in a bar room where I didn't even have to bring up God, but wherever I was, it was always a question. People would start talking about God. Exactly. And they'll ask me a question. Oh, yeah, weren't you a holy roller and all this? So we're drinking beer and we're talking about God. And here I am, like, this is super awkward because I knew I was not <laughs> living for God. I knew I was in willful sin. That's and that's right. not something to be proud of, but I'm telling you from experience, right. I know the difference between when I was saved and when I was not. And, and I, let, me say, let me say this, because the same things happened to me in my life coming up. I think when a person has a calling on their lives, right? Uh, the, the people might not know that calling. They don't know you on that side, but because that calling is there, exactly, they, in, they're, they're, they feel in, the impulse to talk to you about God, right? And and I've talked to many of when I was had a beer in my hand and maybe a reefer in my other hand and yeah. talking about God, right, right. You know, but I knew I was in sin, right? I knew I wasn't right. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean. But I still had the hunger right. for, for God's love and his righteousness. Right. And that's why I was saying earlier, anybody's accepted Christ and experienced it, right. they could always have that hunger. And, but at that time, if I got killed in a car wreck, right. I know right. where I'd be. I wouldn't be in heaven. Right. I wouldn't be eating cracklings with St. Peter, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. And to... I, and because uh, this is a loaded topic, so forgive the forgive to the studio uh, audience, or we, we call it our church, of course, our our church members, not trying to drag drag this out. But there's so much to, to talk about in these topics. Uh, this particular topic alone covers so many different things, and it's not to say, and I'm going to be careful with my words because it's very sincere and it's very real. We're not going to tell you that you lost your salvation once you slip up. That's not what we're saying. We are saying that if you live in what I've always said, continual, willful, habitual, unrepentant, conscious sin, you are choosing sin, the very same thing that brought Christ to the cross for his death to pay for your salvation. 
when you know that you are consciously choosing sin, that's where the Hebrews uh, 11 comes in, yeah. that there, there's no more sacrifice of sin. You, you've, you've I think it's Hebrew, crossed that line. Hebrews 10, 26. 10, 26. 10, 26. So I said 11, yeah. Hebrews yeah. 10, 26. Yeah, that's right. If you willfully sin after coming to the knowledge of right. truth, there, there remains right. no more sacrifice. There for remains sin. Christ's sacrifice no longer remains. Yeah. Right. Right, so salvation is not your set of keys. It can't be lost, but I will always say it can be purposely and willfully forfeited when you choose sin over God. Uh, so I do want to remind uh, the audience, uh, either by radio, podcast, or YouTube, please remember to disagree, uh, agree to disagree where applicable because we're not trying to, the Bible tells us that God hates the spirit of debate. So we're not trying to stir debate, but we're going to be honest with you based on the scriptures. You really have to seek this out um, and 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 search your heart, search the scriptures, and right. pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give that to you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so as I wrote, is uh, it is not becoming of the characteristics of a Christian to willfully debate and have yeah, a spirit right. of debate in that. Romans one twenty nine covers that. So if you are sincere and seeking further understanding as opposed to any spiteful debating, please feel free to contact, comment below or email us at info at heartofworshipchurch.com. If you have any further questions, if you're sincerely seeking, you're like, you know, I, I didn't see it that way, or I read the scriptures a little bit differently. Pastor Glenn, myself, Jacob, and even others, we're all uh, here connected online. We're happy to talk to you about that. So we definitely want to uh, seek after the truth unbiasedly. The wonderful thing about us being non-denominational, and that's not to knock denominations, but it is to say that we want to stand in a position of unbiased where we can say, I'm looking at the scripture based on what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us, not what our conference says, not what our our president of this conference is teaching us, right? Or any of that. So we go, strict, go, go, we go strictly by the Bible. What does the word say? What does the word say? That's it. And and like we like we've done with this program here, we do it every every subject. We look at both sides, mm-hmm. three sides. If there's three sides, we look <laughs> right. at three sides. We look at all the sides, but we're going to still go by what the Word of God says. That's right. That's right. Because we don't trust in the arm of the flesh or the mind of man. Yep. We trust in the Word of God. That's it. Brothers and sisters, remember that the Word of God will stand forever. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, and 1 Peter one twenty six. If you're on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe. And click that bell for notifications. If you're listening on a podcast platform, we ask that you would follow us. It would really help us out. And again, if you have any questions, uh, comments, or even topic suggestions, email us at info at heartofworshipchurch.com. We'd ask for you to join us on our next episode as we cover the topic of filthy communication as we navigate truth in a world of opinions. This has been Daniel Wright, Jacob Leger, and Glenn Mayu, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We'll see you on the next one. Godspeed. Thank you for joining us this episode. For more information on our ministry or to contact us, please visit heartofworshipchurch.com.